Welcome everyone and welcome to the second and final part of our webinar series, Making an Impact, Developing and Tracking Your Community Health Strategies. My name is Eileen Aguilar and I'm a public health consultant here at HCI and I'll be your facilitator for today. I know that we have a very limited amount of time together and we have so much information to share with you, so I'll get right into with, with it with a couple of housekeeping items. You've all joined um, the event in a, as an attendee, so you're automatically muted for the duration of the webinar. But if you have any questions as our presenters go through the slides, please feel free to type them in at the bottom right hand box of your WebEx window. We'll be monitoring your questions as they come in, so please make sure to select the All Panelist box when submit submitting them. It looks like we have a great group today, um, so we're really excited to see what questions that you have for us today. In addition to our speakers, we have a, um, some fellow HCI team members who will be supporting the webinar as panelists. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can throughout the presentation, and we'll make sure to bring them up during our Q&A discussion. I wanted to uh, make a final note that we will be recording uh, today's webinar and there will be a uh, pr the presentation available to you following today's webinar. As I mentioned before, I'm Eileen Aguilar and I'll be playing the facilitator role. Now I have the privilege of introducing our presenters for today. First off, we have Jane Chai, our community health subject um, matter expert. Jane has worked in community health for the past 20 years. Prior to joining the HCI team, Jane joined, Jane joined and worked at the public health department in Orange County, California, and worked there for 15 years. She was responsible for coordinating community health planning, strategic planning, and workforce development and quality improvement. Our second presenter today is Madra Brown, and she's a public health consultant with HCI bringing over a decade of public health experience to her work with clients. Her expertise lies in quality improvement, um, policy development and advancement, and coalition building and sustainability. We're very lucky to have both Jane and Madra for today's webinar. For those of you who aren't familiar with who we are, HCI has been a leader in the community health field for over 13 years. We've conducted over 200 community health assessments and implementation strategies with partners all across the, the country. We've also provided strategic direction for community health initiatives, and we're known for our award-winning customized technology platforms. Along with powerful analytical tools, our platforms provide access to continually updated population health and socioeconomic data to help tell your community stories. Like Jane and Madra, HCI's employees bring both a combination of advanced public health degrees and real life experience in community benefit and population health. Now that we've introduced ourselves, we'll be turning off our webcams in order to maximize the quality improvement for the uh, remainder of the presentation. And with that, I'll pass it over to Jane to take a deeper dive into the objectives for today. Thanks so much, Eileen. Um, I wanted to note that today is the final part of our webinar series, Effective and Actionable Assessments and Plans. Um, part one, which took place last week, focused on how to ensure that your assessment is a living document that engages community partners and leads to shared action. Today, we'll be discussing how to both implement as well as track your community health strategies. So let's talk a bit more about our objectives for today. We'll be covering ways to develop strategies that consider national frameworks and local data, create short and long-term performance measures to track improvement, and track and share progress effectively across departments and organizations. This visualization of a community health assessment and planning cycle shows the different phases of the process, starting with planning and organizing for your efforts, then collecting and analyzing the data, synthesizing data and agreeing on priorities, engaging partners and activating your plan, and finally implementing and tracking your plan. As we're getting going, please feel free to share in chat which of these areas has been the most challenging for you. In our first webinar, we talked quite extensively about the first few phases. 
So today we'll be focusing on phases four and five, how to set your implementation strategy or community health improvement plan for successful activation, implementation, and evaluation. From our experience, by the time communities get to this point, they are ecstatic to have their community health assessments completed, but also a little exhausted and unsure of how they'll gather the energy to keep going. So hopefully today's webinar will help provide some inspiration and ideas as you move forward. Madra, I know you've had a lot of experience helping clients work through this whole process. Can you talk about some things to keep in mind as they bridge their work from assessment to implementation and evaluation? Absolutely, thank you so much, Jane. Yes, I have had the pleasure of helping our clients be successful through each part of this cycle. I know many of you are working to meet those IRS or FAB requirements for your IS and CHIP. Here, we're showing some of the key requirements for each. For those working to meet IRS requirements, your implementation strategy should include the actions and the anticipated impact for addressing health needs identified in your community health needs assessment or CHNA. For each health need, there should be a description of resources the hospital is committing to and your planned collaboration with other organizations. If there are needs that were identified in your CHNA that you've decided not to address, your IS should include an explanation of why the hospital facility has made that decision. For health departments working to meet accreditation requirements, your CHIP should show broad participation from community partners from various sectors. It should be very clear that your CHIP consider findings from your community health needs assessments or CHA, including data themes and assess identified by and assets identified by the community. In addition, the CHIP will need to consider national, state, and local priorities, including measurable outcomes, necessary policy changes, and identify responsible parties for that implementation. Finally, you'll need systems to review, revise, and track your plan. Let's talk a little bit about the ways we've worked with clients to address these requirements starting with considering national frameworks and local data to inform your strategies. My grandmother always said, start how you wanna finish. We recommend starting with a plan for evaluation in mind. We think it's important to engage your community partners around evaluation as early on as possible to ensure buy-in for the evaluation process. As you are building your framework, your evaluation framework, consider timelines for goals, objectives, and outcomes, deciding who will be responsible for collecting and analyzing the data and how you will share those results. One thing we wanna caution you against is parachuting in and out of evaluation activities, collecting data from community members and partners, but not sharing back our analysis and results. Discussing your evaluation plan from the very beginning is a good way to build some accountability for yourself and your community partners. Jane, can you speak to our efforts around health equity and how Conduit has incorporated that lens into the work we have done with our clients and their communities? Yeah, thanks so much, Madra. Um, health equity is really something that's been central to HCI's work since our founding. And we know that many communities are using a health equity lens for their community health assessment and planning process as well. Here we're showing an image adapted from the Bay Area, uh, Bay Area Health Inequities Initiative or BARHI. And we really like this framework. We think that it gives a good visual of uh, community level indicators for health and social determinants of health. So this framework also helps us consider types of strategies that can work um, to impact health and the root causes of health inequities. This is not to say that if you're interested in applying a health equity lens, you should only consider strategies that are more upstream, so those on the left-hand side here. In fact, we know that we need to do both, especially at a time when many communities are in, are in immediate need of services. 
So as you're applying a health equity lens, it's likely that your plan will still include individual or group level services, such as health care or health education classes. But there's also a need to consider longer term strategies that address upstream institutional and social inequities, such as racism, poverty and disparities in education. Let's move on to how to consider national frameworks in your plan. We like national frameworks such as Healthy People 2030 or the National Prevention Strategy, which we think are a great resource to help inform your plan. Healthy People sets national objectives that you can consider as you're setting targets or considering strategies. And Healthy People's leading health indicators can help identify high priority objectives that you might want to track over time. The HCI platform includes comparisons of local indicators to Healthy People 2030 targets to help our clients identify how their community is doing compared to those targets. Now, if you don't have an HCI platform, you can go to Healthy People, the Healthy People 2030 website to look up the national targets and create a comparison for your community. Aligning your efforts with state or local initiatives is another way to build in some synergies in your plan. State health improvement plans can provide a framework showing priorities and benchmark at the state level. So while you may not adopt the state's benchmarks as your targets, they may be helpful in framing your local strategies. If you're a local agency or a hospital, consider how your strategies might align with the local health department's health and community health improvement plan, their CHIP, um, which will also have some local targets identified. Finally, many state or local organizations such as a local United Way or March of Dimes will have local regional initiatives with identified goals or objectives. This can help you identify good targets or areas for shared action to build into your plan. In conducting your community health assessment, you likely reviewed how local data compared to state or national data to identify your priorities. That same information can help you set reasonable targets for your plan. This is an example of an HCI dashboard that shows values for indicators for a county compared to state and national values. If you don't have a dashboard, this information might be in your CHA or your CHNA or can be pulled from local, state, and national data sources such as CDC, American Community Survey, or state or local health departments. Once you have that data, it can be used to inform your local targets. For instance, if addressing STDs is a priority in your plan, you can know, uh, and you know that syphilis rates are higher in your community compared to the state, you might set your local target to match the state's current value. Many communities have overall values that look better than state or national averages, but when you look at the data by age, gender, or gender identity, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or neighborhoods, there are areas of disparities. Understanding these disparities at the local level can help inform targets and strategies in your plan. Here you're seeing hospitalization rates due to diabetes by race, ethnicity. As you can see, Black or African Americans and Hispanics have rates that are higher than the county average. So even if the, low, if the overall hospitalization rate for diabetes in the county or service area is lower than the state average, it might be a good idea to work with community partners to identify appropriate targets and strategies that would address those disparities that we're seeing. Understanding trends in community level data is also important to setting reasonable targets. Objectives often set targets to increase or decrease a metric to show improvement. However, if trends in your local region have been worsening at a significant rate, you might wanna consider a more realistic objective to stabilize the trend or even reduce its rate of increase. Madra, can you talk about how you transition from looking at these local data to setting some goals and objectives? Absolutely, Jane. We've already started talking about how to use data to inform our targets and strategies. Now let's talk a little bit about targets or performance measures. Performance measures help show how we're progressing on our shared objectives. There are generally two types of performance measures that communities tend to use when tracking progress and impact. 
community level indicators measure long-term outcomes for a whole community. For instance, prevalence of obesity for a zip code or county. Program specific indicators will measure short-term outputs or outcomes for a program. For instance, the number of people who completed a diabetes management class or the percentage of participants who showed increase in knowledge after participating in that class. There is often confusion or anxiety about which one to track. We find you really need to track both. Community level outcomes give us an overall picture of what is happening in our community and whether we're getting close to our goals and vision. Program specific indicators give us more real time input about actions we're taking to impact short term objectives. In your planning process, you likely identify a shared vision that guides your efforts with your partners. To help us better see what outcomes to track, we recommend using a logic model or an evaluation plan that helps you better understand how to move from that shared vision to shared action. Based on their shared vision, most communities then decide on about three to five priority areas with goals that they, they will commit to working on together. Goals tend to be loftier, long-term, and look at community level impact. For each goal, communities typically have another three to five objectives that set targets at a shorter time frame. Many communities will also name a range of strategies to help guide their activities included in the plan. For instance, a community might indicate that they like to have a strategy that work that works at the individual organizational community and policy level. Finally, for each objective, you likely will have another three to five activities that support those objectives that are tracked more regularly, like monthly or quarterly. Here's an example of an evaluation framework for one priority area with the elements we just discussed. A high level aspirational goal, measurable objectives indicating baseline and targets, types of strategies to include, activities to be tracked, and reporting structure indicating responsible parties and how data will be collected. Having this type of framework will also help you move forward in tracking your activities and objectives, which Jane will talk a little bit about later. Now let's talk about setting some SMART objectives. I'm going to guess that more, most of you have heard about SMART objectives or objectives that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. At the top of this slide, we're showing an example of the typical layout of a SMART objective. We, of course, recommend using the SMART objective approach when setting up your performance measures. There are also a couple of new parts of this acronym that we think are important, especially considering the work that we do, and those are inclusion and equity. The addition of, included, of inclusion pushes us to engage traditionally excluded groups in our process, while equity pushes us to consider how the objective will move us toward equity. Let's get into some examples and how you might incorporate some of the elements we just talked about. Here's an example related to obesity, which is a common priority for our clients. The goal stated is taken from Healthy People 2030. It is at the community level and feels huge. There is no time frame or target stated. Our objective has a time frame and calls out cities that we may want to focus on in order to address some disparities we found in our assessment. Please note that if you do this, it is so important to work with community members and partners to make sure that this is framed in a way that is appropriate and respectful. Also, especially if you're addressing a health inequity or disparity, consider how you will ensure that solutions are inclusive of the community who are impacted. For example, activities to support our objectives include empowering resident leaders and working with them to increase school wellness policies in higher risk cities. These objectives and strategies, of course, would only work 
if they were developed alongside community partners in these cities. Here's another example of a priority for many of our clients, behavioral health. Note that there is that the highest level is labeled priority area rather than the goal and the lowest level is labeled strategies versus activities. We wanted to acknowledge that different communities sometimes use different terminology. While we just showed you our idea evaluation framework, we like to meet clients where they are. So we don't want to be overly prescriptive here. Use what works and what, what makes sense for your community. The aim is to make sure your plan has a sound logic model and measurable short and long-term objectives so that you have a clear direction for implement, implementing and tracking your plan. Moving on, another factor shown here is considering current trends when setting targets. The objective shown here is an example of how you might set a target to stabilize a rate rather than reduce it. If you find that you're doing better than expected in a year, you can and should, of course, always adjust your target to reflect those changes. Finally, this example shows a tiered approach with activities happening each year, as well as a range of strategies for individual and system level improvement. These are things that you can work into your plan. We hear from our clients concerns and questions about how to incorporate health equity in their performance measures. I think a key concern is wanting to acknowledge that this is an important part of our work, but also wanting to be realistic about how we can be done in three to five years. We've seen this done a few different ways. Some communities use health equity as a lens that informs how they look at indicators and targets for their plan. Some might use a framework similar to the one we showed you that helps them consider social inequities and living conditions in their planning. For others, it might be a part of their vision statement and some will have it as a goal or priority. We're not pushing any recommendation, but this is just, we want to acknowledge that there are many different ways that communities can approach this work and that is okay. One thing we have been asked is how to measure your impact. We recommended that this is something you'd like to do in addition to tracking some of those community level indicators we showed you earlier. Consider what is attainable with current partners and resources. This might mean that some of your initial performance measures around health equity will be relatively short term. Here are some examples. Tracking the number of non-health agencies such as housing and transportation that are participating in your partnership or the number of hospitals that have signed onto a health equity pledge or the number of programs that are conducted in a social need in a social needs screening. These may feel like small wins, but over time you can build on them to build momentum for the long term. I'm going to pass the mic to Jane, who will talk about how to take this process to the next level by tracking and sharing your progress. Thank you so much, Madra. That, that was a lot of great information. I'm going to now walk us through the next big piece of the planning and evaluation process, which is around tracking and sharing progress. We know that this is often where partners lose steam, uh, but we feel that it is really the most crucial step in your community health planning work. Tracking and sharing progress builds trust, ensures transparency, and shows accountability for your plan. So to help ease the burden of tracking and sharing progress, we really encourage a collaborative approach that involves your community partners in data collection, analysis, and reporting. This ensures that the process is more sustainable because the workload is distributed across different people and organizations. Also, sharing accountability for evaluation increases buy-in of the process. And finally, having multiple organizations involved will ensure broader impact of your strategies. We discussed the importance of building an evaluation framework that includes identified goals, objectives, activities, and responsible parties. As you're creating your plan for data collection and analysis, these are some of the questions you might be asking. Which individuals or organizations will be involved? 
what metrics are you tracking? Will they include only quantitative data, data, so just numbers, or also qualitative data, so descriptions of how things are going? And finally, how will you be managing data collection? Will you be using a template for a report or a software solution? And how often will data be entered or reports generated? There are many ways to effectively collect um, data and track your plan. You can use spreadsheets, Excel documents, or you can use a strategy tracking software. Here's an example of a document that allows you to track some of the things we just talked about. The prioritized need and goal, the action plan, including objectives, strategies, activities, and responsible parties, and progress on outputs and outcomes. While this includes a lot of important information, we've heard from our clients that this can feel overwhelming, especially if only one person is responsible for collecting and tracking this information. That's why we do really encourage you to get broader participation in data entry and collection from the beginning. One option to help ease the workload is to utilize a strategy tracking software. If you do decide to go this route, here are some things we'd recommend you look out for. The ability to, for individuals to enter data across different departments or organizations. Assignment of clear owners and contributors for activities. The ability to generate templated or customized reports to meet your needs. The ability to manage multiple plans in one place. So for instance, a quality improvement plan, a strategic plan, and a community health improvement plan. And finally, the ability to communicate your progress on your plan to the public. I'll be showing some examples of these features in HCI's strategy tracking platform, which is in partnership with Invisio. Um, but we understand that you may not currently have a platform, but we ho hope that um, this might provide some inspiration for you. We love that when you utilize a tool like this, it enables you to better organize, visualize, and build your plan. Here we're looking at one way to view an objective in our plan. This actually mirrors the behavioral health example that Madra showed earlier. As you can see, this type of view allows you to quickly understand the elements of your plan, from priority area to objectives and strategies. You can easily scroll through to see strategies and objectives in other priority areas as well. You might be seeing the small photo in the bottom left corner of each box. Those are the assigned owners for each element of the plan. And we like the fact that you can easily identify who is responsible for that element. Now that you've put your plan into action and have started data collection, you'll want to be able to report out on your progress. What we found is that different people need or require different reports at varying intervals. That could be monthly, quarterly, or annually. For instance, uh, you might need to report to executive leadership, a board, or a director who really needs to see a high level overview of your progress. So they might need a report every six months or even annually. Then you might have a program manager who needs to see more details about what's been completed and what the progress is. This type of person may need to be updated more regularly, possibly monthly. And funding partners may need quarterly reports to see outputs and outcomes or grant deliverables. And finally, many of our clients have expressed the need to have a publicly facing dashboard that allows community members and partners to track and see real time progress for key outcomes. So here's an example of a report you might pull for an executive. This report provides a high level overview of progress, including a summary of the number of priority areas, objectives and strategies in the plan. The status of the plan, including where projects are on track have been completed or where there might be disruption and a summary of progress on the overall plan and each priority area. The nice thing about a report like this is when using an online system, when using an online system is that it can be pulled on demand. We've all been there uh, when we've been asked to pull a report quickly. And so being able to create a report at the click of a button can save a lot of anxiety in those moments. I know I have certainly been there. Um, here's another example of a report that a program manager may find useful. This report allows the manager to track the status of each project by showing clear owners and contributors, 
the progress and status of each strategy, objective, and priority area, details of the last update entered, as well as the date of entry, and the expected end date for each strategy. Of course, there may be other reporting elements that you'll want to include. So if you're considering a software solution, we'd recommend a platform such as this that allows you to easily customize generated reports. We also like that a tool like this will ensure better quality and consistency of your reporting. The last type of reporting you might consider is providing high level progress updates that are visible to community members. This ensures accountability and transparency of your plan, which we mentioned earlier are crucial to the success of your efforts. So here's an example of a publicly facing dashboard that shows progress of activities in your plan alongside community level indicators. In addition to a high level summary of progress, your public dashboard should also include tracking of key metrics. So for example, here we're showing a detailed view that tracks monthly referrals to a suicide prevention hotline, which was a metric for our behavioral health priority. Just a note here that many of our clients need to track, track both qualitative and quantitative data. This is especially true for emerging areas such as health equity, where performance measures may be more difficult to, to define. So in this example, you can see an update about the suicide hotline alongside um, qualitative data. So whether you're reporting this on paper or through a software system such as this, this will likely be an important feature of your reporting. Madra, we've covered a lot here in terms of tracking strategies, and I'm gonna hand this back off to you to close us out and share any final words on the things we've discussed today. Sure, thanks so much, Jane. We really wanna acknowledge that many of you are likely using a collective impact approach to your work. Having a system for tracking and sharing progress reinforces this approach by allowing you and your partners to contribute data through shared measurement systems, track mutual reinforcing activities, and create an infrastructure for reporting and accountability. We really wanna applaud you for looking for ways to meaningfully track your impact as an organization. We know this process can feel daunting and very overwhelming. We encourage you to take a long-term perspective. We found that it does take a lot of time for communities to learn from their progress and each cycle builds on itself. So know that you're rarely starting from scratch. Over time, your learnings will move you toward long-term change and improvement. If you're still feeling like you need an expert guidance, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. That concludes our presentation and will lead us to a discussion portion of the webinar. Please feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A track. For this part of the webinar, Jane and I will turn our cameras back on so you can see our smiling faces. Eileen, can you share any questions that may have come in? Yes, thank you, Madra, and thank you, Jane. Yeah, we do have a few uh, questions here. Um, and Madra, maybe you can help us answer this one. Uh, first one is, how long does the planning process usually take? That's a great question, and one we get quite often. I will say it's a two-part answer. So there is a CNH, CHNA and a IS timeline in the planning process. There's a difference between the two. The CHNA process is much more structured and outlines and works in tandem with the IRS requirements and their timeline. The implementation strategy has a little more flexibility, um, which also I think um, it also works with the IRS requirements and timelines associated, but it allows your organization to really get down to the nitty gritty, push for the improvement um, and move that report to action. So, Two-part answer, uh, IRS timelines associated, but implementation strategy a little more flexible. Great, thank you, Madra. Our next question, um, maybe you can help us answer this as well. What are some ways to engage stakeholders and gain buy-in? That's a question we get all the time, especially around collaborators. Um, I would say, start how you wanna finish. 
engaging your stakeholders from the very beginning um, really is the best key to success. Your partners, they want to be engaged. They want to have a real value add to the process. So really working with them from the very beginning is the best key to success. Um, really having them feel invested in the process, uh, not just today, but for today and tomorrow. Um, Jane, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And I agree, one that I think everyone is is working towards is stakeholder engagement. And actually, I was thinking back, we kind of had this question at the last webinar. I talked a lot about um, trust building. I think it's really important to build that trust and that can take time. And I think that's one of the things I love about our consulting team is that they really are as out front or as behind the scenes as our clients need us to be. So sometimes clients already have some relationships built um, with their community partners that we just need to leverage. So through this process is a great time to continue to engage with your stakeholders, let them know um, that their voice is being heard throughout the process. And as we mentioned, even getting them, the more involved they are, I think in that data collection and the reporting, the more they will stay engaged with that process. Um, the other thing, I think we don't talk about this as much, is sometimes the relationship um, with community partners, you know, hasn't been there or there's been some strain. I think that's also a great time to bring in, um, you know, a neutral third party. So that can be a consultant. Um, I mentioned at the last webinar that could be, you know, trading services with another jurisdiction that has this type of um, expertise, um, but having a neutral third party then help you facilitate some of your conversations might begin to build those um, relationships for you so you can participate as well as them. Um, I know when I was at, at the health department, that was one reason we would bring in um, you know, consulting teams is they could help us facilitate conversations that can bridge those relationships, help us build um, engagement with our stakeholders. Um, but I think we also want to acknowledge that, you know, you, you, you're also a stakeholder. So having that third party can also help you engage. So, you know, oftentimes um, when I was at the health department, it was harder for us to engage because we felt like we had to be neutral. So if you can bring in someone else and that way you can participate and sometimes help, um, others hearing that you're having some of those same thoughts and challenges um, can build that bond um, for the whole group set, so that you feel like you're really working towards uh, together towards that shared goal. Um, so that's it for me. Um, Eileen, were there any other questions? Yeah, thanks, Jane. Just a couple of more, and I think you can help answer this one as well. So the question is, our collaborative includes representation from a different from a few different organizations. Can, um, can the tracking software be used by people working in different organizations? Yeah, so great. So this question is about the, the tracking software we showed earlier that we mentioned um, we have in partnership with Invisio. And absolutely, uh, this is actually something we hear from our clients a lot. Many of our clients are either working in large organizations where there are multiple departments that are involved, or they're working across organizations. So there's a health department, a hospital, community-based organizations working towards a plan. And one of the challenges is they don't have a shared system necessarily, or you know, one place to track all of this progress. So we were you know, really excited about the software cloud-based solution that allows partners from different agencies, different departments to enter the data. So absolutely. Um, so each, and the nice thing is it's unlimited users. So that means you can have um, multiple people who are entering this information, creating reports and those dashboards that we talked about. Um, another piece is sometimes you don't need everyone to have like a login, so they don't need to be entering information, but you might have a board member or a board that needs like a regular report. Um, the nice thing is you can just have that report sent to those folks without having, um, without being a user or having a login. That's a nice way to keep folks engaged as we were just talking about earlier. Um, and I think my favorite feature about this that spreads um, the load a bit is that you can also set up automatic reminders. So I'm thinking, you know, if you're across multiple organizations, sometimes it's hard to tell, you know, who's in charge or someone might resent having to be the one to 
constantly remind everybody, please enter your data or, you know, whatever it is. The nice thing about the, the software system is that it you can just program in to say, you know, please send out a reminder at, you know, three days before, a week before um, reporting is due and everyone gets that reminder, everyone enters their data. So, um, you know, back to what we were saying during the presentation portion about spreading that wealth for collecting information, um, I think that's where a software solution can be really helpful. Um, and if you have any questions, um, please contact us. Our contact information is up, so please feel free to contact us and we can talk to you more about it. Thank you, Jane. Great. And uh, one one last question before we end the webinar in Madra. Maybe you can help us answer this one. Sure. Um, so the question is, we are really struggling to track our progress with health equity. Do you have any examples or strategies for this? Sure, sure. And I think that's what we hear very often from our clients. Again, I want to echo something I said earlier in the presentation. Start how you want to finish. At every opportunity within every step, we talk to our clients about how to build and intertwine um, an equity lens throughout their CHNA and IS process. So I say sometimes it's in the weeds, it's through the forest, and it's in individual trees. It's the data collection tools and strategies. It's the questions we ask, uh, the intentionality behind those questions and the incorporation of community voices from the onset. Those are some examples of tools and strategies we use to bring um, equity and inclusion to the forefront, but I wanna give Jane an opportunity uh, to answer as well. Yeah, thanks Madra. And I, I would echo again, what we talked about earlier, which is you know really considering that framework and that's why we we really do like the bay area regional health inequities initiative the bar high framework because you can kind of zoom out a bit to see you know are we looking at indicators are we looking at strategies and indicators that are both downstream and how do we move sorry that are um yeah downstream and how do we move upstream so how do we keep pushing ourselves to look at you know, the conditions and root causes impacting health inequities. And I think the last thing I would say is, I, this is an area that, as Madra said, we hear all the time that folks are struggling with or challenged with. And I think we as a field, we as communities are, are really um, working towards this in a way that we will see some impact, we will see some outcomes, and we're just maybe having that frustration of, of starting. So I just say, you know, just just get started. Um, as Madra said at the end of the presentation, it's an iterative process. Um, you know, you'll have small wins that you'll continue to build on, and over time, I think we're gonna see a lot of improvements. So I have a lot of hope in this area. I think that the frameworks that are out there and the tools that Madra has talked about um, are, are some of the ways that we will begin to, you know, achieve those changes that we, we wanna see so badly. Great, thank you so much, Jane, and thank you, Madra, thank you both for your expertise today. Um, it was very informative. So again, we just wanna thank you for um, presenting. And it looks like we're just about out of time. And of course, we um, wanna be con conscious of everyone's busy schedules. We've put our main contact email on the slides here. If you have any questions on how you may be, um, how we may be able to support you or your organization, please contact us. For our current clients and attendants, please feel free to reach out to your account manager or your project manager if you have any questions following today's webinar. Again, thank you everyone for joining us today. And that concludes uh, today's presentation. Have a great rest of your day.